Today we're going to be talking about perspectivism. It's a, it's a view closely related to relativism, but it is not exactly the same thing as we'll see. The idea is that whenever we have a belief about the world, whenever we see a certain way, the world a certain way, we're seeing it from a certain perspective. Uh, but that doesn't mean, according to the perspectivists, that ideas of truth uh, go away, even an absolute truth goes away. Instead, we understand something like the absolute truth about the world as a limit of these perspectives, a combination of perspectives. And so this is a view that tries to admit a certain insight by aesthetic relativism while retaining a robust notion of the truth. So how is that possible? We're going to look at two instances today, one from ancient India, and then we're going to look at another more modern version of this view to try to get an understanding of what the perspectivist is all about. So let's start with Jainist perspectivism. We've talked some about Jainism, uh, an Indian religion, and a set of philosophies centered around the notion of ahimsa, non-injury. So the idea is not to cause harm to anyone or anything. And along with that comes a certain metaphysical picture, a picture of truth that is a perspectivist picture. So we've talked some about Jainism. It's a religion and philosophy tracing from Mahavira, uh, a contemporary of Confucius and the Buddha. It's best known for that emphasis on nonviolence, ahimsa. But it also advances a version of perspectivism, a version of this view that there are different perspectives on reality, all of which have a certain kind of legitimacy, none of which captures the entire truth. So whatever we say, whatever we think, we're really capturing something about the world, but not everything. Which means everything we say and think is in one sense true, in another sense false. And that leads to a very different conception of logic and a different way of thinking about belief, about language, about all sorts of things. Well, giant aesthetics we've discussed a bit. The ethical views are based on five great vows. The first one is non-injury, okay, on himself. Do not harm any living being. The second is truthfulness, be honest. Tell the truth. Of course, we're going to see that truth here is <laughs> uh, something that is relative to a given perspective. Then, respect for property, chastity, and finally, non-attachment. So you can see elements here of Buddhism, of Hinduism, uh, of other views blending into a certain conception. And as we'll see, what the theory of perspectivism within Jainism comes to is something like uh, an intellectual, I think so, an intellectual non-injury and non-attachment. So, the idea is you can fulfill these vows. Vows. <laughs> why am I having? I'll, I'll tell you why, why I'm having trouble saying that. In my native tongue of Pittsburghese, that there is no vowel, and so I still don't know how to say it. In when I sing, I always sing the wrong thing. The choir master is always yelling at me for bad vowels, and it's partly because, okay, vowel. How would you say that in my native language? Vowel. <laughs> okay. In fact, tile and towel sound the same in the way I call it. Top. Okay. Uh, <laughs> or flyer and flower, just flat. And so I can't say those. I mean, something like this. I, anyway, I'm going to have trouble all day today because of this. In any event, yeah, they believe that these ethical precepts can be fulfilled only from a certain metaphysical standpoint. Okay. Uh, if you are convinced that you have the absolute truth, then you've got, you might say, license to not only argue with other people, but to oppose them, to try to suppress their views, to do things to keep them from speaking their mind. And so the China says, look, if you're really to respect other people, to respect their beliefs, to respect their freedom to speak uh, and to think as they choose, you've got to have a view that says you don't have any monopoly on the absolute truth. So the thought is, look, Absolute truth is something that leads people to injure others. Um, it, they lead people to become attached to this particular conception of the truth. It sometimes leads people to physical violence as well as to intellectual violence. And so it's problematic. Now, a relativist sometimes uses this argument to say, so get off this notion of truth altogether. But the China says, well, wait a minute. There really are certain things that we want to affirm, and not just affirm as true for us, but we want to affirm more broadly and so the Chinese wants to find a way of doing that too. So affirming that in some sense, yes, some things really are true. The idea of absolute truth is not incoherent. But to affirm that none of us 
has any monopoly on it, and in fact, none of us can really fully capture it. So how does this go? Well, to put it simply, perspectivism is the view that truth is relative to a given perspective, to a stand, to a point of view. So I'm seeing things in this classroom now from a certain perspective, from a certain point of view. And I can tell you what it looks like from this perspective. You're seeing it from a different position. And so you have a different standpoint, a different perspective on what's going on in the room right now. And we're all capturing something correct about the way things are in this room. But none of us is capturing the entire truth. I, for example, am seeing the front of a lot of people. I'm not seeing the back of your heads. Uh, and some of you are in a position where you can see the back of other people's heads. You are seeing different perspectives. One time, I sat in the back of a class I was team teaching to give me a totally different perspective. For one thing, I realized that the chairs in that classroom squeaked horribly. When I was up in the front, I couldn't really tell that. These classrooms are built so that sound goes easily from here up there, but doesn't come that easily in the other direction. And so I didn't realize until I sat in the back that the chairs were squeaking incredibly distractingly. I actually, the next, the next uh, Friday in that class, there was no class afterwards, brought in some WD-40 and squirted all over the chairs. So that's one thing I learned by taking a different perspective. Another thing I learned is that lots of people in the class had laptops open, and some of them were using them really in creative ways to help their learning, and others were doing completely irrelevant things, uh, you know, chatting with friends on Facebook or this or that or the other thing. And so that too was an interesting perspective. I always imagined that everybody's laptop was open because they were eagerly taking notes and, you know, maybe Googling things like, ooh, you mentioned Mahavira, let me Google Mahavira. Well, yeah, some people were actually doing that. It was, in a sense, very encouraging. <laughs> but that was two or three out of a hundred that were doing that. And others were, well, considerably more were doing other things that were really just distractions. But that too gave me a different perspective, something I could see from that back of the room that I couldn't see from the front. So the idea here is that truth is really relative to a perspective. At any given point, I'm seeing things only from a point of view. What I say might be true from that point of view, but it might look not very true if you're seeing things from a different point of view. Well, if we just stop there, it looks like we would have a version of relativism. But the perspectivist doesn't stop there. They say, look, this idea of absolute truth, it's not impossible, it's not incoherent. It's just the sum or the limit of these individual perspectives. So how can you capture the complete truth about the room? You'd have to see it from all different perspectives, okay? from all possible perspectives. You'd have to see it from my perspective and your, from your perspective, from the perspective of somebody way back in that corner of the room, from the perspective of someone hanging from the ceiling, from the perspective of an ant crawling across the stage, flipping around, and so on. If you could somehow capture all those different perspectives on the room, then you would have a picture of what the room is really like. And so there is a way, according to this view, of actually doing that, but no individual human being can do it. It's something that would be a sum or a limit of all the perspectives we can take. Each of us is trapped within one at any given moment. Now, part of the optimism here is that I'm not stuck in. The relevance, especially the historical relevance, like Nietzsche in his middle period, thinks, look, I'm, I'm stuck at this place in time. I have the view of somebody in the early 21st century, and I'm sort of trapped within that conceptual framework. But the perspective says, well, no, I can move around, I can change. So for example, in this room, I'm not just stuck here, I can move around. I can see different things. And as I move around the room, I'm getting different perspectives. I'm seeing things from different points of view. Now we can do that much more broadly. Only God or some kind of enlightened being could really see things from all perspectives at once. But I'm not trapped in one perspective. I can move around, I can see things from different points of view. So although I'm limited, ultimately, in the <coughs> points of view I can consider, I can consider more and more perspectives. So in the room, it's easy to see what that might I move around the room, I walk around, I see things from different points of view. But more broadly, if I'm thinking about philosophy, or I'm thinking about the nature and meaning of life, or I'm thinking about all sorts of topics like that, how can I do this? How can I actually Seeing things from different points of view. Yeah. Do a or a oh, I can do a survey or a questionnaire. I can find out how you, know, how you see things and get some idea of what your perspective is on. What else? Um, do you say to take into account of my experience So basically, you say that you say that you say that you say that you 
people and we should respect whatever they say or believe because every statement contains some element. I've noticed over the past few months that Facebook has gotten to be a really hostile environment for many people, okay? Um, and there are a lot of people who really don't want to hear anybody say or think or argue for any position they don't like. Uh, the China says, look, oh, that's really unfortunate because no matter what your view is and how many things are being said for it, there are arguments on the other side. There are aspects of reality that are being left out of your view. And so it's really important to converse with people who disagree with you and do that respectfully. So the thought is, well, everybody has a certain point of view, and there's a certain kind of legitimacy to every point of view. Now, that's not to say that everybody's right. It's not like, you know, this person says blah, blah, blah. Oh, you're right. This person says, no, that's not true at all. You're right. Somebody says, I can't believe you're right. You're right. Uh, it's not like that exactly. It's really just that no matter what somebody is saying, they're getting certain things right. They're expressing a certain standpoint on reality. That really is the way it looks from a certain point of view. But that's only from one point of view. And it might be a very limited point of view. It might be a very broad point of view. So it's not as if no views are better than any other views. Some are. Some are capturing many different facets of reality. Some are capturing only one or two. And so it's not as if we say, oh, uh, say whatever you want. It's all good. It's all true from a certain point of view. Some points of view can actually incorporate lots and lots of information from different points of view. And the more we do that, the closer we come to an accurate picture of reality. Well, the picture of the world then is precisely that it is many sides. It has, in fact, infinitely many sides or aspects or facets or dimensions. Some of these are actually in opposition to one another. And so there are different models we can use mentally for understanding the world, and they all have some legitimacy. There are different ways of thinking about things, and they're all based on some correspondence with reality, some connection. They're all seeing something. But none are capturing the full infinity of all of those facets of reality. So whatever we say is true in the Sanskrit, yet. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> well, it's translated as maybe, or perhaps, or in some respect. So everything is true, yet, and also false, yet. Everything is true in some respects and false in others. We never capture the whole truth. In fact, sometimes I teach students <laughs> a little trick to know what Aristotle would say about anything. Okay? Raise any question for Aristotle, what is his answer? Yes, in some respect. In other respects, no. <laughs> okay? And although his view of truth is not this view, someone could easily read Aristotle and think, yes, what he's doing in every case is saying, aha, here's the opinion of so-and-so. Well, it's true in some respect, it's not true in other respects. And the giant says that's true about everything. Aristotle's attitude in practice is really the right attitude to take. No matter what view you encounter, it's getting certain things right, but not everything. So here's the classic story that illustrates this, the blind man and the elephant. Okay, the blind man all the way up the elephant trying to describe what the elephant is like. And they all have models that they are introducing of what the elephant is really like. And all of them are capturing something about the elephant. But none of them are capturing the full truth about the elephant. Here is a more ancient depiction of the same story, but with a very strange looking elephant. And here's a statue of the blind men and the elephant. It's a story that actually has a great deal of resonance in Hinduism and Buddhism as well as in Jainism. Here is a poem by a, a British poet from the 19th century describing this story. I find it sort of amusing. It was six men of Hindustan to learn and much inclined who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy the mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl, bless me, it seems the elephant is very like a wall. The second, feeling his tusk, cried, oh, what have we here, so very round and smooth and sharp? To me, it is mighty clear this wonder of an elephant is very like a steer. The third approached the animal, happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, then boldly up and spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. You're not nearly as amused by this as I am. I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, you've got to go, go back to your childhood. This is sort of a children's story, but it's, it's making a serious philosophical point here. 
The fourth reached out an eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. Tis clear enough the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth, who chanced to touch the ear, said that even the blindest man can tell what this resembles most. Deny the fact who can, this marble of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth, no sooner had begun about the beast to grope, than, seizing on the swinging tail, it fell within his scope. I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of Hindustan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. That captures exactly this giant's view of truth. Because every person there did have some justification for their view. Everyone was capturing something about the elephant, some facet. Indeed, in some respects, the elephant is like a rope, is like a fan, is like a wall, is like a tree, and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, none of them are capturing the full truth about the elephant. And notice what happens. If they think they've got the answer, then indeed they dispute loud and long. They argue for their position. But if each says, ah, there's something about the elephant that is like a fan, it's like a rope, it's like a tree, it's like a snake, and so on, then there's no ground for arguing. Because I could say, there is some aspect that's like a wall. Ah, oh, but you say some aspect is like a fan. OK. We can try to combine those into a picture of what the elephant is actually like. Well, going along with this then is a certain view of language, maybeism, it's called, or relativism in some translations, though I think that's a bad translation. The idea is that language then is capable of expressing the truth, but only from a point of view. Just as I can only grasp the truth from a certain point of view, so language can only articulate the truth from a certain point of view. And this has some sweeping implications for law. Aristotle says every proposition, every statement is either true or false. But now, according to this view, that's much too simple. Actually, <laughs> Bobby Nevisori in the 12th century develops this into a theory of language based on sevenfold predication. And here's the idea. Things might be true or false or indeterminate or true and false or true and indeterminate or false and indeterminate or true and false and indeterminate. So here are the seven possibilities. It is. It is not. It is and it's not. It is indeterminate. It is and is indeterminate. It's not and it's indeterminate. It is and it's not and is indeterminate. OK. Now, my name, oh, yeah, this is the explanation. <laughs> On the other hand, think about when you answer a question with Yes and no. Does that ever happen? What's a question you might answer with? Yeah, yes and no. Yeah. Do you like Texas? Do you like Texas? Oh, yes, well, yes and no. Like some things about Texas? Don't like it. Or what is about? Yeah. Do you like philosophy? Do you like philosophy? Oh, yes. I'm sure you say, oh, yes, it's possible. But not if I say, well, Yes and no, right? I like some things about philosophy, I don't like other things about philosophy. I'm afraid to ask for a third example. <laughs> What's another thing about like this? Yeah. Like whether you slept well. Okay, good. Did you sleep well? Yeah, you might say, ah, yes and no. No, I can't wake you up, but in between us, I'm pretty well. Um, and so, yes, there are lots of ways. In fact, that's a good example. Because it's not as if just, aha, this is a rough topic and I can say there is. It's pretty common to answer that question that way. Oh, yes and no. It might be, yeah, I woke up frequently through the night, but on the other hand, I got back to sleep very quickly. So did I sleep well? Mm, okay, in one sense, yes, and in another sense, no, right? And that kind of thing comes up all the time. So start listening for that, and you will find people saying yes and no um, a surprising amount of the time. And the giants will say, I told you so. <laughs> now, this does have some pretty imp important implications. Here, for people who love logic, I've got them here, but I'm not really assuming this. But here are some things that the Jainists will then say don't work. For example, the law of bivalence, which Aristotle argues for. Every statement is either true or false. The Jainists is not true. Some are indeterminate. No statement is both true and false. Ah, but the Jainists says some, some are both true and false. It might be and not be. In fact, it might be and not be and also be indeterminate. Here's an inference pattern, disjunctive syllogism, either A or B, but not A, therefore B. Sexist empiricus, in fact, says, well, do dogs understand this inference pattern? Because the dog that is sniffing a trail, let's say there's a, it's, it's been tracking an animal, and the path slips, it will sniff on the one side, if it doesn't pick up the scent of the animal, it will just run down the other side without sniffing. It says, all right, it either went on this path, that path, didn't go on this path, so it goes on that path. 
So, Sextus says, even the dog understands destructive syllogism. But the giant says, no, 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 wait a minute, that doesn't follow at all. Because it might be that B is false, uh, that not A is true because A is false, but what if A is both true and false? Then this inference pattern can fail. Even Moses comments, if A is true, then B is true. But A is true, so B is true. The foundation, you might say, of modern, modern logic, the giants will say that is What if A is both true and false? What if B is both true and false? There will be problems when we try to think all of these things through. So, without going into details there, the idea is, yeah, some sentences actually can be both true and false. Sometimes it is because there are different respects. Like, yes, I slept well in one, one respect, not another. Or there are different facets of things. Yes, I like this about Texas and not that about Texas. Sometimes it's just because it's vague. Am I tall? Well, I'm kind of tall, right? I'm not really tall. I'm actually a midget in my own family. My brother is 6'4". Uh, but I'm taller than average. And so am I tall? Well, I'm kind of tall, right? So if somebody said, is Bonnebach tall? I'm like, yeah, yes and no. Right? Kind of, not really. Uh, sometimes it's a question of conflict. And sometimes there are other paradoxes. So what do I mean by conflict? Ah, you've made a promise, but now it turns out fulfilling that promise is really going to hurt you. <laughs> and you really don't want to do it. Should you fulfill the promise? You might say, oh, yes and no. Right? I did promise, so I really do have an obligation to promise. But on the other hand, it's really going to have some harmful effects, and I shouldn't bring about those harmful effects. And so, should I do it? Mm, yes and no. Or maybe parallels. This sentence is false. Is that true or false? So what's he saying? Well, it's true. But it says it's false. So it's false. Yeah. But it's false. Well, then it's like, wait a minute. It says it's false. So it's true. And in Western logic, this is a deep problem. All sorts of people continue to write about liar problems. But the giant just says, I told you certain things are true and false. And you might say, I'm not sure it's really most true and false as a result of that. Fine, it's true and false, and it interpreted. You're not. Well, anyway, I find like that. Yeah, never mind. Uh, but all of these are ways in which you might think, look, oh, it's not crazy to think some things are both true and false. Well, there's something pluralistic about this view. There's a pluralism of perspectives. And in fact, the more perspectives we consider, the closer we get to reality. So the thought is reality is just so rich that it makes true all sorts of things, and in fact makes everything true with sufficient qualifications. So it can underlie and give rise to alternative pictures, even to conflict opposed pictures. Now notice this is not skepticism. It's not just the view that we can't know whose perspective is right. It's that every perspective captures some elements of the truth but leaves out others. It's also not the same as relativism, because the underlying picture really is that reality is many-sided. And so there is such a thing as an absolute truth, an absolute way the world is. It's just that we'd have to see things from an infinite number of perspectives to understand what that is. Well, as we mentioned before, this is understood to be a view that gives us the tools of intellectual non-violence. Intellectual, I think so, of respecting other people's views, of respecting the fact that other people have a legitimate perspective on reality. Is it self defeating? The giant says no. It's just one more perspective. I want to turn now to a more modern version of this view. It's one we find in the Spanish philosopher uh, Ortega y Gasset. Ortega is somebody who, as you can see here, was born in 1883. Um, in other words, born right around the time that Nietzsche was in his relativist stage, died in 1955. He starts with the dispute between realists and idealists, and ends up saying something very much like what the Jainist perspective is. They're both on something, but neither one quite gets it right. Now, again, you might say, wait a minute, one is saying everything is lying in the other is saying, no, it's not true. How can both be, in a sense, right and both be, in a sense, wrong? It's got to be one or the other. But Ortega says, look, that it's not so simple. Here's the problem. An idealist says everything is mind definite. Everything is really some kind of mental construction. And indeed, the entire world is something like a projection of my mind. But he says, wait a minute. There are obviously aspects of this world that are not just a projection of my mind. Think about a tornado, okay, or the Tennessee fires that are going on right now. Those aren't just projections of my mind. I mean, if they, if they were, for one thing, I'd certainly be able to say, mind, stop, stop burning Tennessee. <laughs> Okay, but that doesn't work. And so there are hard realities 
because we have to confront that are not of our own making. And somehow the idealists can't explain that. In the end, you've got to say, wait a minute, the whole world is a mental construction, but lightning, tornadoes, tsunamis, those don't <laughs> seem to be things that are really just mental constructions of some kind. Camille Paglia puts this point in a very nice way. Hey, fellas, there's something out there that electrocutes people on beaches, collapses buildings like cardboard, and drowns ships and villages. It's called nature. <laughs> and the problem really is how do you embody this notion of nature in an idealist view? But on the other hand, he doesn't like realism either. That sounds so far like an argument for realism, but he says that's too simple as well. Why? Well, the realist says some things are independent of the mind. But, hold on a second. If the mind is over here, and the world is over there, and they're independent of one another, how is it ever possible to have knowledge of the world? So in the end, he says, look, now I've got a problem. How do the mind and the world interrelate? It's not just the mind-body problem, it's the mind-world problem. And he says, in the end, surely this leads to skepticism. Here's a way of thinking about it, really. If I isolate the mind from the world, if I take it out of the world and say, all right, well, the mind is supposed to be some kind of mirror on the world, then I will not be able to understand how knowledge is possible because I won't be able to explain the connection. And so in the end, he says, there is a classic argument for ideas, mainly skepticism. If there really is a world independent of my mind, then how can I really know about it? It looks like there's this gulf between mind and world that's going to keep me from having knowledge. And so an idealist says, so, aha, let's treat the world as dependent on the mind. Ortega says, well, that won't work. But we need a different solution for the same problem. The idealist is right, in other words, to point to a problem in the realist picture of the world, but is wrong about the way to solve it. It's not to go to the other extreme and throw out the world altogether. So what can we do? He says, here's the problem. Both are assuming that the mind and the world can be separate. They can't. The mind and the world are deeply intertwined. It's not that the mind generates the world somehow. It's not that the mind just reflects the world. Instead, the mind is part of the world. And it interacts with the world in such a way that you really can't talk about one without the other. So the whole division from which this distinction between the realist and the idealist starts, this gap between mind and world, he says, get rid of the gap. Recognize that our minds are just part of the world. They are you know, integ integrated with the world from the very beginning. You cannot understand the world without understanding our own cognitive faculties and our own minds and the contribution they're making to the way we understand the world but we can't understand ourselves without appeal to the world. And so, really, we cannot divide. It's very, something, it's very similar to the opening page of Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, where he says, I can't understand God without understanding myself. I can't understand myself without understanding God. And so, really, myself and God are intertwined. And Calvin starts from that premise. Ortega is putting the world in place of God and say, it's just like that. I can't understand myself without the idea of the world, and so the idea is wrong. On the other hand, I can't understand the world without the idea of myself and the way in which I am contributing to the way I see the world. And so the realist is a Yeah? Um, what do we say about uh, when we say that the world can exist without us? Let's be clear we can't understand the Or can we say that? But for his, 
For Ortega's, you know, say, let's put that aside for a moment and think about where he's going with this. Because he says, look, this suggests something really important about the way I have to understand myself and the way I have to understand life. He says, I am myself and my circumstance. Who I am, what I am, depends on my situation in the world. And even if the realist is right, even if that has a kind of priority, nevertheless, you might say, I can't really grasp the world without grasping myself. I can't grasp myself without grasping the world. And so, um, even if one has a kind of metaphysical priority, as a matter of my own understanding, they have to come together. I can't really separate. So we can describe this view as contextualism. I have to understand myself, and then he says really everything else in context, in a broader context. In fact, I and my circumstances together, he says, constitute life. So he calls his method vital reason. Reason that respects life. Reason as appreciating things as they occur in a context. Reason can come to conclusions reliably only when it focuses on life, taking into account both the thing and the context in which that thing occurs, both mind and world, both subject and object, understands that there is perhaps something out there independently of me, and yet that the way I perceive it is completely, I shouldn't say completely, but is deeply shaped by my own nature. So, it is historical. He wants to say, look, we don't just occur in a context outside of a historical setting. And so there is a sense in which Nietzsche and Hegel are right. There is a historical dimension to this. To understand lots of things, I have to understand their context. And that means I have to understand how they've come about, why things are that way, how did this happen. But I also have to be willing to understand the context in terms of the things in it. And so I can't grasp the thing without the context. I can't grasp the context without the things. And there is a historical dimension to all of it. So it's contextualist, it's historical, it's also dynamic, because I have to think about the way things change. Now, what does this mean about me? Well, I frequently have to encounter my own limitations. There are aspects of the world that indeed don't seem to be in of my own making, and not just natural disasters, all sorts of features of my life. I'll place bounds around me. I'm free to act, but only within a certain context. So I'm free to choose who I am and to live my life the way I want within the context that history and my given place and time establish for me. But on the other hand, there are things about that that are really fixed that I cannot change. And so he says our lives are dramas in which our freedom confronts those boundaries. We find out what is really possible for us and what turns out to be impossible for us. Some of this is a question of our own abilities. Some of it is just a question of the limitations that the environment and the context place on us. So, who am I? Well, I'm a person who was born in a given place and time. Okay, here I am as a little child with a baby crocodile. hat on. <laughs> okay, that's me as a baby. Um, the fact that I was born in a certain place and time does establish all sorts of things about my life, right? It makes it possible for me to do all sorts of things. It makes it impossible for me to do all sorts of other things. By the way, I was a really cute baby, wasn't I? I mean, I sort of gone downhill all through my life. <laughs> you know, I, and it's not just me, right? I was born at a certain time. I was born in a certain place, grew up in that house, and so, and in a certain city. There are all sorts of things I can be, but all sorts of things I cannot be as a result. I cannot, for example, decide that I want to be a Roman consul. Suppose I start studying Latin, like this would be cruel. I want to be like Caesar and Pompey. I don't rule ancient Rome. It's like. Too bad, dude. <laughs> Born too late, right? Can't do that. Or, suppose I say, I want to be a medieval monk. I'm reading a history book and I found out that because the water in the Middle Ages was pretty unreliable, monks were allocated a gallon of beer a day, which is true. And I think, a gallon of beer a day, that is awesome. Sign me up. <laughs> well, I can't do it, right? I mean, there are still monasteries, but they don't give people a gallon of beer a day. And anyway, if I can't sort of do the whole evil thing, what, what's the point? I can't be a starship captain, right? I can't watch Star Trek and think, oh man, I want to be the successor of Joel McCarthy. I can't do it. There are no starships. Or, I can't be a cartoon character. I might watch South Park and think, I want to be that guy. Uh, but I can't be that guy. I can't be a cartoon character. I can't be T.S. Eliot. I might read his poetry thinking, oh, I wish I'd written that. Thinking, huh, I wish I were a TSM. 
Well, tough. I can't be T.S. Eliot. I can't be Ingrid Bergman. I can't marry Ingrid Bergman. Okay, these are things that just are impossible for me. I can't be a roadrunner. There are all sorts of things that I cannot do and cannot be. So, my freedom is bound. There are all sorts of things I can do and I can be and that you can do and can be, but certain things you can't just because of your historical setting, just because of the place you were born, uh, the time you were born, and so forth. Well, he's, he's concerned to say, well, I'm not giving a view that is a version of relativism. This is different. And here's the way in which it's doing. He says, imagine describing a landscape. A house surrounded by some trees, say. There's no one perspective that captures that completely, but no view is arbitrary. No view is just a mental construction. Every view is revealing something about reality. So here is the Gilbert Stewart house in Philadelphia, for example, just across the street from Independence Hall. It looks like that from the front. It looks like that from the side. If I just showed you those two pictures, you might think, that's a totally different place. But it's not. It's the same house. So we could think about the truth of a house as something like a combination of all the possible perspectives. The combination of seeing it from the front, seeing it from the side, seeing it from the back, seeing it from above, seeing it from inside, and so on. But that totality is in its own perspective. None of us can actually see it from all those points of view of loss. There's no place to stand from which we can actually do that. So, here's another house. This is the house of um, somebody I know in New Hampshire. Okay? If you start describing it there, you're like the blind man in the elephant, in a sense, except you're not blind, but I'm only showing you a part of it because of the limits of photography. I can show you that. I can show you this. Show you that. And then tell you, <laughs> it's all the same house. Just different parts of it were built at different times and on very different plans. So in the end, you could move around and you see something new about the house all the way. Awesome car in front, too. 1950 Chevy. But anyway, you get a different perspective. And somehow to understand the house, you have to combine all those different points of view into one vision. But there is no place to stand from which you see all of the ones. So Ortega says, look, here's the problem. We see the world from human perspectives. We can't see it from God's point of view. We can't see it, as philosophers say, from speculate and tematos, from the point of view of eternity. We can't see it as God sees it from all perspectives at once. We instead are trapped within a given perspective. And so we might have this perspective on the Earth. This is a view of the Earth from Saturn. The Earth is that little dot. Well, actually, on the screen, you can barely see that little dot there. There's another perspective on the Earth. But of course, you and I are typically not seeing it from those points of view. We are seeing it from a point of view down here. And yet, my view of it is pretty limited. Kant's view is even more limited still. He never traveled more than 10 miles from where he was born. Uh, and he didn't have the vision from space that we could have by looking at these photographs. Still, you might say, no matter how many of these perspectives we get, we're only sampling finitely many of the infinitely many possible perspectives on the world. 